Okay. So uh, I'm going to be giving a talk on SSH, which stands for Secure Shell, uh, if you don't know. <laughs> Uh, so SSH is one of those tools that you find pretty much everywhere. Uh, most Linux distributions are going to have an SSH client. It's probably already installed uh, whenever you install the system. Most Linux distributions are going to have an SSH client that's installed. It may even be running without you even configuring it. Uh, most servers that you're going to deal with are going to have some sort of SSH surface running on them if somebody needs to have access to them uh, with anything other than just I mean, it's really the only way that people uh, do remote shells nowadays. Um, and you can get great clients on Windows. You can get great clients on OS X. Um, it's really one of those tools that is absolutely everywhere. And so even though it's not necessarily what someone would think of as a hacking tool, it's not something that, you know, every, you know it's, it's like the secret tool that's able to, to do something covert or do something interesting um, with respect to hacking stuff. Uh, it's really one of those tools that, if you know how to use it really well, uh, in an information security context, it can both be used really effectively for defensive things and for offensive things, uh, particularly getting through firewalls. So without further ado, I'm going to talk about some of the, um, first, first a little bit of background knowledge about uh, how, how the world of SSH works um, and how how the things that we're going to try and do with this, or the sort of things that we're going to try and do with SSH, um, why they're important. Uh, so first, I'm going to go over just TCP. Um, so a lot of you probably know what TCP is. Uh, it's how you make a connection across the internet. Um, but a lot of people don't know the really important details about how TCP ports interact. Um, so TCP, uh, it's basically, it's a way of making a bidirectional connection between two computers on a network. Um, so let's imagine we have these two hosts, 10.0.0.2 uh, and 10.0.0.1. Uh, we're going to imagine that we are on 10.0.0.2 for right now. Uh, so that's going to be some sort of client, and then the other side is going to be a server. So imagine we have some sort of HTTP server running on our server. It's going to be listening on a particular, HTTP, on a particular TCP port, uh, in this case, por case port 80, uh, which is the standard port for HTTP. Um, and let's imagine we also have a browser on our client side. So you normally think of, oh, we point the browser to port 80, and it just it fetches a web page. But how does it actually establish that connection? Um, so what it really does is it connects itself to one port on the client side. This is the, the component that's usually hidden. Uh, and these port numbers that are above 32,768, although the, the range may vary depending on your operating system, are known as the ephemeral ports. Uh, and those ports are only allocated temporarily, and they're only allocated for client connections. So you think of there really being only one port in a particular connection, but in reality there are two ports. There's one that the client is using, and there's one that the server is using. So if you have this browser, it uses this port to connect to port 80 on the other side. And the, the really important thing about these client ports is that they're the thing that allows you to have multiple clients for a single server. Uh, even when those clients are on the same host. So if we have a second browser, it's going to be allocated a different ephemeral port. And that can still connect to port 80 and have a completely distinct TCP connection. So you can have two browsers with two different users on the same, same host, and they're both connected to port 80, and they don't conflict with each other. And the usefulness of this is that you can actually give a four-part address to any particular TCP connection. It's made of the IPs of both hosts and the port numbers, both the client and server for each side. So one thing that we're going to be dealing with a lot uh, are the components of SSH. And SSH uh, is really just a normal kind of client-server construction where you have a client uh, called SSH and a server called SSHD, which stands for SSH daemon. Uh, and the SSH daemon is going to listen on port 22 in most installations. So you can make it listen on different ports, uh, but the standard one is 22. So if you're, if you're just scanning through a network and you see 22 open, almost definitely that's going to be SSH. So I'm just going to do a quick demo um, of some basic things that we can do with SSH. So the simplest thing you do with SSH is use it to do a remote shell, which is why it's called secure shell. Um, so I'm going to connect to a server. 
so here the syntax is just SSH name of server. Uh, so this would normally be some sort of full URL. So this, this is the URL of uh, the Gray Hat VM server, which is running upstairs. Um, and this dash P says to connect on port 10,022. Uh, so it's not actually, the particular client that I'm trying to connect to is not listening on port 22, but 1,022. Um, this is because it's actually a VM, and I had to port forward some things. But what you can do, um, so this is, this is a prompt, I talked about this last time. Uh, it's basically asking you, it's giving you this information to make sure that somebody is not trying to uh, trick you into connecting to a server that you don't want to. So this number in the middle here is known as the keep fingerprint. And this is, this is essentially a hash of, it's, it's like an identifier that's used for uh, the, pro the public key of the server. So every server is going to have its own pair of private and public keys that are used for encryption. And the public key is, is freely given away to anybody who wants to connect. But the private key is kept hidden. And the usefulness of this, these two keys is that anything that you encrypt with the public key, you can decrypt with the private key and vice versa. And there's a mechanism, it's a little bit complicated, that involves the handshake that SSH does, where uh, you can establish that the server actually has the proper private key only by knowing its public key. Uh, so basically what this allows the SSH server to do is use the public key as an unforgeable, unforgeable token of its identity. So this number is going to be the same for that server as long as it has that key pair. And no other server can forge that they have this particular key pair without actually going in and stealing the private key. Uh, so when you first connect to a host, if you don't, if you haven't written down that you specifically want, yeah? Okay. I found your page. <laughs> um, if you haven't said that you specifically want this host to be trusted, then it's gonna ask you and make sure that you, you wanna trust this host. So most people just say yes to this. Um, and it says that it permanently adds it to your list of known hosts. So you actually have this list of hosts and public ID, of uh, public keys that you trust. Uh, and that is local, and I can actually show you which file that's in. Um, and the, the most important thing about why you need to make sure that it's exactly the same host, because if, if this, this prompt appears again when you're logging into a server that you've already logged into, that means that either they've changed the keys, yeah? You have a, Yeah, so yeah, if, you're, um, if you really need to make sure that your client's connections are safe, then you should put something like this, uh, you should make it publicly available. Uh, and it's, it's perfectly safe to let the public key be public. That's why it's called the public key. Um, you just need to, yeah, so the, the clients will need to make sure that it's this number and not some other number. In reality, uh, it's usually fine to accept this when you're first connecting. Uh, because you usually don't, uh, I guess it, it really depends on the circumstances. But if you see this ever change, that's definitely cause for concern. Um, because imagine, because I, I mean, here's a password prompt right here. If somebody put up a fake server and they just listen for passwords, because the password is being, it's not being sent across in plain text, but once it gets to the server, it's being decrypted so the server can see it. So if I were to connect to a rogue server and I gave it my password, it would have my password in plain text. Um, which would be bad. So basically, um, you don't want it to connect to servers that you don't know, um, and the public key system is one way you can do that. Let's see, I think I just took too long. There we go. So it's a little bit hard to tell that much changed because I have exactly the same prompt on both of these systems. Can we pause? Sure, yeah. Can you have pizza? Okay, so uh, does anybody have any questions so far on anything about what I've said so far? We're good? Okay. So uh, currently, I'm actually on a remote host. Uh, it looks pretty similar because I actually have the same user. Um, I'm just on this thing called SSH demo server, which is the virtual machine that I set up. Uh, oh, you have a question? No, sorry. Um, Okay, so I'm currently on this, this remote host. I can, if I ls, there's nothing there because I actually have, uh, this is 
not my laptop anymore. Um, so that's pretty cool. I can run commands remotely. That's usually what SSH is used for. Uh, but you can actually use it for a couple other really neat things. So what this server is actually doing, it has an instance of Nginx, which is a HTTP server. It's not really configured. It just sort of has the defaults. Um, but there is an HTTP server that is running on this uh, virtual machine. However, port 80 is not actually connected to the outside. So it's, it's in this little virtual machine. Let me just draw a quick little picture. So we have, we have this virtual machine. And it's inside this larger box. And it's port 22 is actually connected to the external port 1022. Uh, and I have my laptop somewhere over here. And it's going through the internet and connecting through here. So it's connected to the VM like that. The VM also has an HTTP server. And it's connected to port 80. But port 80 is effectively being firewalled by the virtual machine host. There's no way to get to port 80 directly. So what we're going to try and do is connect my laptop to port 80 on the remote host without actually connecting directly through port 80. We're going to use this technique known as SSH tunneling. Um, and that's, that's part of the reason that I went over TCP, because there's a lot of TCP stuff that you have to sort of be able to visualize. Um, so we can test at least that the server is running from the remote. Uh, so if we use this tool NC, which stands for netcat, uh, it's just it's a really simple way of talking directly to a TCP connection. So NC-P80 is going to, um, actually I think it might be, yeah, it's running on 80. Um, this is just going to connect directly to, oops, sorry. There we go. So this is going to connect to the local machine, which is actually the server. So localhost, when I type localhost, localhost is a little bit confusing because we're dealing with two ends of a connection at the same time here. Uh, I mean, currently we're, we're just on the server, so we're only dealing with the server. But localhost doesn't necessarily mean my laptop. It could mean the server, depending on the context. So I'm just connecting to port 80. Um, and I'm going to be super cool here and issue an HTTP request directly. Uh, so what this did is I made a request to the server. Yeah? Yes. So really what localhost is, is it's a, it's a shorthand for the IP address 127.0.0.1, uh, which is the IP of this virtual network card called loopback. So you, you, have all, you can have more than one network card on a machine. Um, so you have like a wireless adapter, and you have your Ethernet adapter, and you may have other stuff. And all of those can have separate IP addresses. Uh, so you can, you can receive information on all of those. There's also always a virtual one called LO, or loopback, and that is used for sending messages from clients on the computer to servers that are also on the computer. Um, so we're basically, we're just listening locally instead of on some particular outbound thing. Uh, so this, this basically proves, you can see, welcome to Nginx. This was actually an HTTP server. Um, so this, this thing I did right here, I'm just going to, this, this is actually a full HTTP request, this plus two new lines um, is actually making a full web browser sort of connection to the server. I'm just typing all of it. Um, but that's just a, a nice way to test because I don't actually have a web browser on this remote machine. Anyway, so what I, what I ideally want to do is be able to point my actual web browser to that machine somehow and get a page from it. So what we're going to do is known as an SSH local tunnel. Uh, and local tunnels are done with the dash capital L flag. Um, so essentially what we need first is for SSH to be connected to SSHD on the remote. And that's what we already have. Um, and we have an HTTP server that's running on the remote. And we have a browser that's running locally. And we need to connect them together. But we have a firewall in the middle. So we can't actually directly connect these two pieces. So what SSH is going to do when we set up this tunnel is actually relatively complicated. Uh, and it essentially involves encapsulating a whole connection inside the connection that is already established between SSH and SSHD. Uh, so I could draw all of that, but it would get really messy. So instead, I'm just going to draw this as if, as if the two ends were magically connected. Um, what's, really happening, what's really happening is those two are, are connected only virtually, and the information that's passing between them is actually passing between SSH and SSHD. 
So the browser is going to connect through a client port to port 8080 in this case. Um, so 8080, the reason we're using 8080 instead of 80 is because 80 is a, a privileged port. You need to have root access in order to bind anything on 8080, or sorry, on 80. Um, anything below 1024 is a privileged port. Uh, so this is just gonna be easier because we don't have to use sudo. Um, the HTTP server is already running on root on the remote. So then what's gonna happen is this is going to connect on 8080. That connection is going to be forwarded to the remote. It's going to come out appearing to be a client connection and it's going to connect to 80. So what the HTTP server is going to see is a connection that appears to be coming from localhost on port, you know, some, some uh, ephemeral port. And what the client sees is that it's connecting from an ephemeral port to port 8080 on itself, but what's really happening is there's a, a full connection all the way from the browser to the HTTP server. Uh, and the way that you actually initialize this is this command at the bottom. Uh, so you do SSH, you do your host, you do you know, ports, whatever, uh, that you're going to use to connect. Um, and then you do a capital N, which means don't execute a command once you've connected. And then you do a capital L, which is for local tunnel. And this, this part that comes after it is a little bit confusing. Uh, it actually took me a while to like really figure out which pieces are supposed to go with what. Uh, so this 8080 here specifies which port on the remote, uh, sorry, on the local machine we're connecting to. So this is, this is where we're binding. Uh, this second half is the port on the remote that we're connecting to, and this local host is in fact which, where on the remote we are pretending to come from. So if we say localhost here, it'll seem like all the requests to the HTTP server are actually coming from the server itself. We can do things like if we know the IP of this server, we can put the IP of the server here instead of localhost, and it'll appear like those connections are actually coming from the internet. Uh, so if you know the IPs of your various network cards, it'll appear like those connections are actually coming from those network cards, or they're coming from different remote hosts. So you're, you're basically masquerading all of this stuff. And, it seems like, you know, that, that seems sort of magic. It's like, how, how is SSH able to do that? It just turns out that you can send, you can send a message, instead of sending it to loopback, to go to one of the servers on your own machine, you can also send it to one of your network cards, and then it comes right back. So you can, you can say, I want to connect to a, a local web server on my machine through my Ethernet card. And the network stack will handle that. It'll just seem like it's going through the Ethernet card. So it'll go out the Ethernet card, be routed right back, even though the, the kernel will actually just do it automatically. So it doesn't even need to exit hardware-wide. And then it'll be, it'll come right back in and connect to the server. Um, loopback is just slightly faster, but you can use this to make it seem like these requests are actually coming from the internet, which may be useful for various purposes. Um, so I'm gonna do an actual demo of that. So first I have to exit out of that connection I made. Um, so I'm gonna connect the same way, I'm gonna use I'm going to make no command, uh, connect port 80, 8080 locally to localhost 80 on the remote. I'm also going to add this flag dash lowercase f, which is going to fork it into the background. So once I finish this command, it's just going to stay there. Uh, so it's still, the tunnel is now established and it's still running. So what I can do is if I make a new tab, and I point it to gray hat VM server colon, uh, sorry, what am I talking about? Localhost 8080. There we go. So this is actually Nginx on the remote server. Uh, it's a little bit hard to tell that it's actually Nginx on the remote server, but trust me it is. Uh, I didn't have time to actually configure it to say something, but uh, this, I'm not running Nginx on my local box, I think. Uh, but this is definitely, it's not, I'm not doing any sort of, you know, sleight of hand here. This is actually happening. So, um, <laughs> so, so that's pretty cool. Um, one thing that you might think about is, you know, what, what if you wanted to, uh, go back to the beginning. there we go. So what if, what if instead we have, we, we still have this two-way connection between the two machines, but, the L command only allows us to connect a client on the local machine to a server on the remote machine. Ah, on the remote machine. Sometimes we want it the other way around. Sometimes we have a server on our machine and we want to make it so that things connecting to a specific port on the remote are going to be forwarded to us. 
so this, this is useful for a bunch of purposes. This would allow you to do something like make connections out of a machine. Uh, like if you, if you had a server behind a firewall, let's say, and it didn't have any outbound access at all. All you could do is connect into it with SSH. You could use this to bind on something like port, I guess if you had root, you could do it on port 80. If you didn't have root, you could do it on port 8080. And you could have normal internet connections seem to, seem from the remote standpoint to go through to the internet when what they're really doing is they're being forwarded through SSH and coming out of your local machine. Um, so this is really a very similar concept. Uh, you may have noticed that I basically just flipped the whole thing. Uh, the difference, the real difference is that SSH is still on the left hand side and SSHD is still on the right hand side. And that's, that's the key because you have, the, the right hand side is still the SSH server and it's still the remote. Um, but we may have servers running locally and clients running remotely. So it's really same deal, you connect through this way and it comes out this way. And the syntax for this is very similar. Um, you have, you connect to the host, don't do command. Uh, you use a capital R for remote instead of L for local. And this 80 is gonna specify where on the remote we're starting. And then here is where locally it's going to masquerade to appear as if it's coming from. So it's, it's really, it's the same syntax. The difference is the first part is actually remote and the second part is local instead of the first part being local and the second part is remote. Um, and it may take a little bit to like really sort that out. But the, the real problem with this syntax I've found is that it's hard to tell whether localhost 8080 is the important one or 80 localhost is the important one. It's really the, the last two are always kind of connected together. And in reality you can actually put another component before the first part. So I, can, I could actually say localhost 80, localhost 8080, and that would do the same thing. Uh, localhost is sort of implied here, but you can, you can do even fancier things. So you can make it like, you can make it so if you try and connect out on a certain network interface to a particular IP on a certain port, then it will be redirected coming from a different network interface on the remote to connect to something. So it's, it's really an extremely flexible tool. You can basically make anything happen. Um, the reason that this isn't used a bit more widely uh, for like actual deployments of things is because it's not as fast. Uh, so if you, if you were to do real port forwarding using something like IP tables or another commercial firewall, um, as well as like messing with your routing tables so things actually work properly, it's gonna run a lot faster. Um, so SSH has the benefit that it can basically just do all of this crazy black magic with very simple commands you don't want to run this in a production environment. But fortunately, well, I mean, you don't want to run in a production environment where you're having a large amount of stuff going over it. Um, fortunately for us, if you're, you know, doing some sort of like CTF thing or you're just trying to like, you know, go in somewhere, do something, it's not gonna be a problem. It, SSH is plenty fast, it's just you don't want to like put your entire infrastructure across a single SSH tunnel. Um, probably not a good idea. So, that's some of the fancier stuff that you can actually do with SSH directly. One thing I definitely want to show you though. Yeah? Oh, you have a question? Um, so I, I'm not clear on the distinction. Um, so if we have, with the first example, if we forward localhost 8080 to 80 on the remote uh, yeah. machine, then when I issue my HTTP request, it goes across, and then I still have something coming back, right? Yeah. So we, I still have well, so, so the, key, the key with that is you have to remember, this is why I introduced the whole ephemeral port concept, because if you, if you just look at this command, you know, just on a, on a page, you think of it, oh, I'm linking port 80 and port 8080 together. But what's really happening is I am saying when something is port 80, it gets transferred to port 8080. It's not even talking about the client ports. So, so this is the, the idea that this is almost, it's sort of a unidirectional, connection, it's not like data can only flow one direction, but you can only connect in one direction, so if I have, is important. On the, on the left here, if I connected to localhost port 8080, I would still hit the HTTP service, right? I wouldn't go back through. And this is yes, idea. yes, that's true. And so that, that's the distinction, that if you're on the machine that things are being forwarded to, then... Well, so, so if you see here where I put these little portals, um, <laughs> so the, I'll, I'll switch back to the, the local one, which is kind of the more common case. So if you see here, this blue portal is connected at 80, but this, this orange one is not at 80. It's up here at a client port. Because when you're doing a local tunnel, 
it's as it makes this fake client on the, the remote and this fake server on the local. So it's, it's not like port 8080 is bound to 80. It's that whenever I try to connect to port 8080, it ends up connecting to 80 over here. But it's not kind of commutative. You can't, you can't go backwards. Um, and you can't, you can't actually connect up through whatever port this is bound on, because it's not really bound on a port. It just chooses one dynamically. Um, okay, so, so it's just, it's unidirectional in terms of where the connection is initiated. Exactly. So yeah, it, it has to go from client to server ports. But the connection, once it's established, is bidirectional. Yeah? Uh, why can you not connect from the browser side to the server side from uh, 32,000 to 32,000 and have the server simply go to the port? Uh, is there some requirement to have 8080? Is that you know, special privileges or something? Or so you, you're asking why this is 8080 and not 80? Or no, well, why not go straight from Just from here straight to here? 80 on the other side. Well, so the, uh, the whole idea here is we have some sort of firewall. Something is blocking us from connecting from here to here uh, over some port other than 22. So, so for instance, in a lot of the stuff with the heavy intelligence computing, the only port to be able to keep open to uh, the external world is port 22. So you can SSH into the machine, um, and then you can act, access it from there. Because basically, you don't want MySQL and you know various other servers open to the public running on machines that are also on local area networks where you have potentially valuable machines running as well. So by only allowing SSH, then you have to have credentials to get into the system and, uh, and basically uh, maintain the file. Yeah, and a, a, lot of, a lot of places, um, they'll actually, you know, if you're, if you're working on like a development server, if, you have, if you're doing some sort of web development, you're just doing it completely internally, um, and you don't have I mean, I guess it depends how your, your stuff is set up. I mean, if, you, if you're an actual company, you'd probably just have an intranet that's not connected to the external world. Um, but if you, have, if you have some sort of server where you're doing development and you have all sorts of important resources on there, they'll often block off all those ports that would normally allow those resources to connect out to the internet, or they'll make those resources only listen on localhost. So you can actually, you can have a server that will only accept connections from a certain source, which, so in this case, because we're connecting everything from localhost, things that are listening for things coming from localhost will accept these connections. Um, in some cases, you'll you'll set an HTTP server so that it only connects, it'll only listen uh, for certain IPs coming in. Uh, so, like you can actually, you can a, a common case is a thing known as a virtual server, um, where you'll have a, a server with a, a bunch of different network cards, and each of those network cards has a different IP address. And based, you'll only have a single HTTP server because there's only one TCP port 80 for that one machine. But depending on where that connection actually comes from, which of those network cards, it can choose a different website to serve. And that's how, that's how services um, where you get like a virtual private server, that's how those types of services work. Uh, they switch based on how, which, which network card it's coming in on and which domain you're actually requesting. Um, so it's, it's a, a level of multiplexing. Yeah? SSH daemon uh, listening on the different ports that you're still specifying? Uh, specify which part of it. So, so the SSH daemon here is just listening on port 22, or whichever port you've connected to. So that's, that's not really part of this line. Um, so in, in the case of the little example I did, I did have to specify port 10,022 again. Yeah, so this, this part kind of before the N is really just specifying how I'm connecting to the SSH server. Um, and you have to be a bit verbose about that unless you configure it so that it automatically knows what you're supposed to do. Um, so, any other questions? Okay, so here's a really neat trick that I actually learned just recently. So, let's say I'm connected uh, over SSH, I'm just logged in. Um, and I want to set up a tunnel. So normally what I'd have to do is I'd have to exit out, I'd have to run another command and fork it off and then connect back in. Uh, and you know, I also might want to do something like exit out of my SSH connection and then connect back to it uh, without using another terminal. So most people think, oh, I'm connected to SSH, all my commands are going straight to the server, I don't have any sort of way of controlling SSH. It turns out that's not right. Um, so if you press enter, so you do a new line, you shift, do a tilde, and then, well, let's do a question mark first. 
So it turns out there's actually an escape sequence that SSH supports. Uh, if you start things with a tilde, then you get all of these different commands that allow you to do different sorts of things with SSH. Um, so I, I press enter again, it goes back to the prompt on the server, um, but I get to do basically whatever I want from this list. So I can do something like tilde control Z, and then I've suspended the SSH connection, and I can resume, or I think, actually wait a second, it's, it's resume job one, no, uh, FG, there we go. So I foregrounded the job, and now I'm back in the, the connection. So I can actually have multiple connections running from the same terminal, and they're all just running in the background. Uh, and I can choose between them and connect back to them and do all sorts of stuff. I can also, let me go back to this thing, uh, so I can, I can list all of the forward connections I have. So this is, this is just the connection for the connection I made here. The one that's run, currently running in the background is on a separate SSH connection. So it's actually using a different client port. Uh, it seems like a completely different connection to the server. But, so I don't have any connections open right now, but I can, um, let's see. There we go. So it gives us this little prompt, and I can do something like, uh, I don't know if this is gonna work again because I still have that thing running. You know, actually, give me a second. I'm just gonna close out of that. So let's say, let's say I wanted to set up exactly the same forwarding that I did last time. I can do that without actually exiting out of my SSH connection. Uh, so if I do tilde capital C, I do L8080 um, local host 80. Oh, it's already used. Okay, so that thing is still running. Um, there we go. <laughs> that should fix it. Um, Okay, so dash capital L, 8080, local host 80. Now it's forwarding the port and it's still connected. So that's just running in the background. I can see it with uh, tilde hash. That should be, I don't know. But if I reload this, we still have Nginx. I'm wondering if, oops, not that. I guess I can't, can't back up through that because it's not actually on the shell. Um, Anyway, you can do all sorts of really crazy stuff. You have to start the line, there we go. So we can actually see, uh, I think the web browser still has a connection open because HTTP will persist that connection. Um, that might be it, it might just be that it's still doing that. Oh no, there we go. So it's, it's, here's the client port uh, of my, my tab here uh, and it is connecting to port 80 on localhost through port 8080. Um, and it's connecting from, so this, this basically, this is localhost IPv6, and I think that would be my local machine. I don't know, anyway, there's a lot of information here. Um, I haven't really played around with this all that much, but I can do, you can do very fancy things with it. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, I really had no idea you could do that before about a week ago, uh, and I surprised a whole bunch of people with that. So, um, so that's pretty cool. One thing that's really critical for usability with SSH. Uh, I, I kind of went over this last time I gave the kind of shorter talk on SSH. Um, but one thing that's really useful for usability is, you know, you, you have to type in a password every time you want to connect to something over SSH. And that gets really annoying. So instead of using a password, and it, there's also the issue that passwords are inherently pretty weak. Um, so if you, if you have a password, someone can crack it remotely. They can just send a whole bunch of requests to the SSH server and eventually crack it. I mean, usually there are mitigation methods for that on SSH, but, you know, passwords in general, probably a bad idea uh, to be sending over the wire. Uh, and there's also the issue that if you connect to a server that is rogue and you send over your password, they now have your password they can try and log into as you with the real server. Um, so what, what you can do, uh, I'm currently, so I set this up last time uh, on this other account. Oh wait, I cleared everything, sorry. Um, so let me just connect to that server again. So we have this again. So the reason it prompted me again is because I switched user accounts on my local machine. So each user has their own list of trusted public keys. Uh, the way that 
SSH generally, oh, wait a minute. There we go. Um, so the way that SSH usually manages stuff is on a very ad hoc basis. Uh, this is in comparison to the two other major kind of crypto things that you'll, you'll encounter on the internet. Uh, if you're talking about like SS, SSL uh, or TLS and HTTPS stuff, that's all going to be uh, certificate based. So you don't really have to deal with trusting or not trusting things. It's kind of done for you. Uh, and you can also talk about like PGP, which is this web of trust model. It's basically crypto, a lot of the problems in crypto really have to do with deciding which public keys you're supposed to trust. With SSH, with SSL, it basically says, we tell you who to trust. With PGP, it says, you can figure out how to trust, but you can ask your friends. SSH really says, I have no idea who you should trust, just trust some people. And it usually works out pretty well. <laughs> um, so that's, that's why everybody just has a list of keys that they trust, the server has a list of keys that they trust. You kind of just set things up ad hoc. It's really easy to set up, but it doesn't scale super large. Um, unless you do some sort of thing on top of it. Uh, so right now we're in, so we're on the remote server again. Um, so I'm going to, so what you can do, uh, there we go. So right, what I did right there is with the command SSH keygen, I was able to produce a uh, public private key pair. Um, and that is useful, that, that allows us so the, the server already has a public and private key. Um, and with those, that public and private key, um, you can identify which server is which and you can actually establish some sort of secure connection with it. However, it's also useful to have a public and private key on the, uh, the local machine. And the, what you can do with that is you can make the server trust a list of public keys so that not only does the server have authentication that it is in fact the server, you have authentication that you're you. And you can, um, as long as you hold on to the private key, uh, you can connect into the box, and as long as it, it trusts that that public key is actually what it's supposed to be using, then you can log in without a password. Uh, and that's pretty useful. So what I did here, um, I generated one that doesn't have a password on it, I have a passphrase on it. Um, and what the passphrase does, it's actually not sent across the wire like the password would be when you're logging into SSH. Uh, it's used to decrypt your private key. So I, I might want to, because there are a lot, of, a lot of different components to this. Um, give me a second. Can everybody see the board reasonably well? Is that going to be a problem? Um, So, so imagine we have our server machine, and we have our client. Uh, so the server has both a public key and a private key. And it broadcasts the public key to the client. Uh, and once this, once this has been established, it's theoretically possible to make a secured connection. What the client then, then does, if you don't have client, uh, client authentication with uh, public private key, is you get prompted for a password. So you get the password colon prompt. And you send over your password in plain text. Uh, you don't send it over in plain text exactly. You're sending it over the encrypted connection. But once it gets to the other side, it's just in plain text. Um, so this on the server, the private key is just sitting there on the disk. Uh, it's not going to be encrypted. Um, but when you generate a public and private key locally, if you give it a passphrase, you're actually going to encrypt your private key with that passphrase. So when you, when you enter the passphrase again, you're able to decrypt the private key, which allows you to use the public key for encryption. Um, but if you don't have the passphrase for your private key, it's impossible for you to use it. Um, and the, the usefulness of this is you get this effect called two-factor authentication, where you have, you have to be the person who has the private key file. You also have to be the person who knows the password to the private key file. So if somebody, if this is your laptop and somebody steals your laptop, if all of your private keys are encrypted, so you put passphrases on them, then even, even, the, even though they have these private key files, they won't be able to log in as you to all those servers that you're authenticated on. Um, so this is, this is strictly better than sending your password across. It also has the benefit that 
you're only sending your public key across as, uh, as verification that you are you. So you're no longer sending your password across, which means if this guy is actually not who he says he is, he doesn't get a copy of your password. He only gets a public copy of your public key, and that's useless. So it's, it's sort of a double, it's doubly useful. It means that you don't have to enter the, well, you do have to enter a password to unlock this key, but you don't, we, I'll show you in a few minutes uh, how you can not even have to enter your password every time uh, using this scheme. And you also get increased security and the server is able to certify that you're actually the person who's supposed to be logging in. Um, so what we did here, we generated our own pair. Um, so actually, I probably want to set a passphrase on that. So let me, let me just, so what, what really happened is all of this stuff gets dumped in .ssh, uh, which is a directory in your, your home directory. Uh, so idrsa and idrsa.pub are your private and public keys, respectively. So I can actually just look at those directly. That's my private key. You don't want to do that normally, because <laughs> if that's actually an important private key. Um, especially if it's not encrypted. This is the public key. So I'm just going to remove those. Uh, yeah. Quick, take a picture. OK, so I'm, I'm going to generate another key here. Call it the same thing, but I'm going to give it a passphrase this time. So now what it's going to look like when I cat this, it's going to say AES 128 CBC encrypted, all this stuff. So this is actually encrypted private key. It looks basically the same. Um, it's just a bunch of basics before. But if you were to take this, it wouldn't be useful to you unless you knew which passphrase I put in, uh, and you don't. So basically, all you have to do in order to make the server trust this is put the public key in the authenticated hosts list on that server. So you, there are a bunch of different ways of copying files across SSH. Um, one of them is SFTP which is, uh, it's basically, it, it acts a little bit like normal, S, normal FTP, uh, except it transfers things over SSH. Uh, that's, that's one simple way to do it. That's how I did it last time. I'm gonna do a little bit fancier way. Um, so what you can do with SSH, you normally just get a prompt that gives you, you know, it, it gives you a connection to the server and that opens up a shell. Uh, but we, you can also do with SSH is run just a single command. Uh, so if I do SSH, And I do something like that. Actually, that's not going to give me much. Um, give me a second. Huh? Yeah, it should be giving me something back. What am I doing wrong? Um, maybe it's like a no. That's not a type type. See if that'll do it. Never mind. I am confused. I thought that was a thing. It's just a command, yeah. Um, maybe. Well, I want it to be sent over as a single thing. Let me just try something as simple as that. Nope. That is weird. Anyway, so I guess I'm going to use SFTP. Because um, what you can normally do, I'm going to, I need to figure this out. This is weird. Um, I'm definitely in, Oh, so there's something going on with the remote. It's still up. Um, that's strange. Okay, well, let's just use this instead. Um, Oh, so if you type control D, that will close a connection. That's basically issuing the end of file character to a terminal. 
so yeah, every time I've been exiting out of a shell and it didn't look like I de did anything, I was pressing Control D. Uh, that that just sort of exits out. Okay, there we go. So for some reason that wasn't working. So what you can do is you can issue a command to the remote server and the standard in of the command will go to that command remotely and the standard out of that command will come back to you on standard out of the, the shell. So basically you can use this to, um, to construct pipelines. So So if I wanted to look at, um, all of the authorized keys, let me make sure that's actually, okay, so I don't actually have anything on here at the moment. Um, so what I can do is, if I take my file here, If I take my public key and I pipe it to this command, I actually make it go into cat and then get redirected to that thing on the remote. So that actually wrote a file on the remote. And if I go back here and I cat it, I'm actually running single commands remotely um, and working them into shell pipelines. So that's, that's another fancy thing you can do with SSH. Um, so if I wanted to like run part of a shell pipeline locally, and then another part remotely, and then another part locally, and then another part remotely somewhere else, and another part locally. You can do that all in one line. Um, so other other very fancy things. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So I basically I put this in this authorized keys file. Uh, so now the server will trust that my key uh, is supposed to authenticate uh, to that user. So if I try and connect again. Um, it's gonna, oh, there we go. So it automatically recognized that IDRSA is the correct key. So that, that's sort of a standard thing. Um, if it's called IDRSA or IDECDSA, uh, then it'll automatically use that as your key. But as you can see, all I had to do was enter the passphrase for the key. I didn't have to enter any sort of password for the server. Um, so that's still a little bit annoying. It's basically back to the same position where I have to enter this password every time. So the useful, the, the next thing you can do, um, is this program called SSH agent, okay? So if you type SSH agent, that turns on SSH agent. And SSH agent dash K uh, kills the, or usually kills the agent. I don't know why I didn't do that. So if I use SSH agent, um, I can now add my key. Hmm, something's wrong here. God, what's wrong? Okay. Uh, so for some reason, oh, I think I know what this is. Okay, there's a the problem. So I can't, I can't do that while I'm change, I've changed users. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna steal the SSH key from that other user. Okay, so now I have various stuff here. Um, so, so I have this file called IDRSA, and that's the, the private key. This is what would happen if somebody stole your private key. So if they tried to uh, SSH in like this, and they pass dash I for, I, for the uh, identification file, then you would get, I guess I have to log in as, or not, Ben Johnson, I forget how this set this up how I set this up. Really?
Oh, I think I know what it is. Nope. Okay, I really don't know what went wrong. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah, that's, oh, there we go. You usually don't want to do that. There we go. Okay, so now that I, since I know the passphrase, I can still use this key. It's not bound to the user in any way, uh, which is why it's bad if someone were to steal it and you didn't put a passphrase on it. So I can get back into the server. Um, so I have, I have this whole setup. Um, but what I want to do is not have to enter that passphrase every time. So if I type SSH agent, I'll start the SSH agent. And then if I say SSH add IDRSA, really? This was working just a little while ago. Okay, somehow this is not working. Normally the way it would work is if you typed SSH agent, it would start up this, uh, this daemon process, uh, and then when you type SSH add, maybe I'm missing, I don't know. Anyway, so when you type SSH add, you would be able to add a specific uh, public key, or add a specific private key to your SSH agent. And at that point, you would be prompted for your password. And what it would do is decrypt your key and store it in memory. So that when you turn off your computer or you log out of your session and all of your processes are killed, then it will, uh, it will be removed from memory. But while it's still in memory, it'll actually serve that key to SSH when it requests it. So you won't have to enter your password anymore. Um, so this, this is really useful. I mean, I was using it for Git just like, Anyway, um, so basically that allows you to get past the whole password thing almost altogether. So you really only have to enter your password once and then you can use SSH a whole bunch of times and that's really useful. It also allows you to put it into those complex pipelines because then you're not typing stuff in every time you want to run the pipeline. So you can, you can use SSH agent and then have SSH running even within a, a shell script. So you could, you could do all sorts of crazy stuff, um, pipe things back and forth, do all sorts of fancy things. Uh, so the one last thing that you can do to make your life a little bit simpler when you're using SSH uh, is the config file locally um, called .ssh slash config. Uh, and I already have a whole bunch of stuff in here. So as you can see, there are a whole bunch of, um, you, can, you can set which host it is and you can set uh, which, which uh, key file you're using as well as which user you're gonna try and log in as by default if you don't put any sort of override. You can also add the port. Uh, so if you want to, if you have somebody who's like really paranoid and is putting all of their stuff on port 4043, even though it's SSH, which doesn't really help you that much uh, because they'll probably be able to fingerprint it anyway. But um, <laughs> if, if you have somebody like that, then you can, uh, you can just set this to port 443 uh, and it will automatically try and connect on 443. If you have something like a virtual machine behind something and you need it to be on port like 10,022 instead of 22, also do the same thing. Uh, so all of, these, all of these things are sort of presets that allow you to not put in all, of, all that much information when you're logging in. Um, one trick that I occasionally use, and by occasionally I mean just once uh, for the gray hat stuff because I keep logging into it so much, um, is normally what I'd have to do is I could SSH to like the actual IP. I'm pretty sure that's still it. I um, guess so. Say the exact IP, or I could go to something like grayhat vm server dot no IP dot org. Um, same deal. Uh, but what you can also do, so I have it set up. So somehow, if I just type grayhat vm server, it also goes there. And that is really just using a hack. Um, Or is that not where I put it? Uh, there we go. Resolve the comps dot head. No. Hmm. Is it where I actually put it? 
Anyway, so I basically just added an element to my local DNS uh, that will redirect Gray Hat VM server to Gray Hat VM server .noip.org. Um, so if you can figure out how to do that, I don't actually remember how I did it, but it's possible. Um, then you can shorten it even more. You can probably make it just like A if you really needed to, to type it really fast. Um, so you can do all sorts of fancy things like that. Uh, so uh, one last thing, I'm going to just show you. So you can see if you go on any sort of server that's running an SSH daemon, uh, you have all of these different elements, uh, different things in etc SSH. This is where all your configuration files are. Uh, SSH underscore config is where you actually configure stuff. So this is, this is the configuration. You have to actually explicitly turn on tunneling sometimes. It depends on your distribution. Gen 2 turns it off by default. Uh, some, I don't know what Ubuntu and stuff do by default, but if you want to have tunneling work, uh, you definitely need to turn tunneling on. Um, that's not always a default feature. Uh, there are a bunch of other things you can change. Uh, you can do stuff for like X11 forwarding, all sorts of other fancy bits. Um, you also have these, these keys here. These are your actual server keys. Uh, so this, this is the server, this is the Gray Hat VM server, so I'm not actually going to cat any of these private keys. Um, but you can see it has three different keys, a DSA, ECDSA, and RSA. Really the difference, those are three different uh, public key crypto algorithms that it's able to support. Uh, RSA is sort of the standard one. That's probably going to be a 2048-bit key. Um, that, that is what you'll normally see. DSA is really old and terrible. Uh, don't ever use it if you can avoid it. Uh, it really doesn't, it's only a thousand bit max, or it's only ever a thousand bit, and it's kind of weird, and it has bad properties. So don't, don't ever do anything with that. ECDSA, on the other hand, is the new thing, uh, which uses elliptic curve cryptography, and basically all that means is it's just the same deal except your keys are smaller uh, for the same amount of security. So it's really, it's splitting hairs, um, but it can, it can authenticate with any of these three. Uh, so it, it'll default to ECDSA if it can, because that's the newer one, which is why when I connected the first time it said, do you trust this ECDSA key uh, instead of something like an RSA key or DSA key. So that's basically it. Um, I have, if anybody has a question. Uh, it depends on your security level. So the problem with RSA is that it doesn't scale linearly with the number of bits. Uh, so if you, if you double the number of bits you have with RSA, you don't double your security. You only increase it by like, I think it's like two to the root three. No, that doesn't make any sense. It's a, it's a weird number. Um, it basically, it doesn't scale properly. So if you're talking about 4,096 bit keys and you want to double the strength of that, uh, you actually have to go to like 15,000 bit keys. Uh, so it's basically not scalable. Uh, ECDSA on the other hand does scale linearly, or it's basically the strength of the key is the square root of the size of the key space compared to a symmetric cipher. So if you have like 128 bit symmetric cipher, you're basically talking about 128 bits of security, like straight, straight 128 bits. If you're talking about a 256 bit ECDSA key, you get 128 bits of security. If you have a 512 one, you get 256 bits. It's very nice and linear. Um, RSA, it's kind of a weird formula. Uh, you need like 3,000 bits for about 128 um, and yeah, I think that's about where it goes. So like 3,000 3, uh, is roughly the same as 256 ECDSA. 15,000 is roughly the same as 512 ECDSA. Uh, in reality, nobody ever needs more than 128 bits um, unless you're like in the NSA. And even then, you don't actually need it. You just like it. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, ECDSA is pretty cool. But from an actual black box kind of standpoint, they're really kind of the same thing. Like. There's nothing magical that you get by using ECDSA except for slight space saving. Yeah? Um, so you can, you can try logging into your server. Um, that will give you the fingerprint. It's not, so I mean I can, I can look at at least, uh, pub. So this, it's not completely straightforward how this gets uh, mapped to that fingerprint. So I think really the most reliable way is just to try connecting to the server. 
Um, there's probably some sort of SSH tool that will take a public key and give you the fingerprint. Uh, you can also, yeah, I mean, um, you can also, if you want to distribute something to people uh, that they can then trust, you can actually give them this public key file, and if they add that as a line, so the, the nice thing about SSH keys is this is actually a single line, uh, and they're designed to be they're designed to be put into these files that are just lists of public keys, so they all go on a single line. So if you, if you basically give a person this thing and they put it on a single line in their uh, trusted keys, or actually, what is it called? It's called known hosts, there we go. So if you, um, if you put, uh, if you just cat this to the end of known hosts on your, on your local machine, then it won't give you that prompt the first time. So that, that's another easy way of doing it, and I guess theoretically a little bit more secure because you're adding more bits to it, but like practically it's, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, nobody's gonna be able to forge uh, a fingerprint without like a lot of supercomputing power in like 50 years from now, so it doesn't matter. Um, any other questions? 